the body of believers is is uh, is a growing growing in in, in in their faith, and yet at the same time there are among them, or there is among them uh, a woman named Jezebel who is being allowed to uh, to be in their midst and and is uh, is misleading and and uh, and, and teaching. Um, committing sexual immorality and, and, and sacrificing to idols and uh, they are not not admonishing her for this they are allowing this to carry on and they say for that he says I will deal with, with her right there is a, you, you, you did some good work there well done did you want to add something to that Um, the uh, thing that stood out to me was that he is saying you allow mm. and um, uh, she how did she get into that teaching position to begin with mm -hmm. um, was it a woman I, I assume it was yeah, yeah. because that's yeah. what it says yeah this is a woman who's teaching and Generally, if it isn't, if it's used as a metaphor, there, as a metaphor, there's always a, like onto or as is right. that type of thing. Was so her name Jezebel? Yeah, that's what he called her. I, I think that, that that's where the metaphor, where the name itself is a metaphor. Was her name Jezebel? I don't know. It doesn't really matter, but at the very least. It was pointing to, to something, wasn't it? The pagan, godless teaching, much like the teaching, I, uh, the lifestyle, and the, the leading God's people astray that happened with Jezebel Old Testament style. Let me just, I'll see if I've got enough battery. Oh, I've got lots of battery. I got lots of battery. Yep. Thank you. So the two things that we're, we, we touched on this morning, what were the two things that were the hallmarks of what she was teaching? I draw a blank. Steve? Yeah, idolatry and sexual immorality. They always go together. They always go together. I would add the third one, which is child sacrifice. In Old Testament times, the three things ran together. They just, that was just a part. There's one thing that we haven't touched on yet, and that's in verse 24. I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. What is that referring to? It's a bit of an odd phrase, is it not? Anybody have any ideas what that means? What that's referring to? Yeah, I think they actually were. But but how? It could have been, but not necessarily. The the sins that are being highlighted here are sexual immorality and idolatry not occultism per se. But what does it mean, the deep secrets? Yeah, that's the question. The teaching at the time was, I have to participate in the things of the culture, even the sin sinful things of the culture, in order to win the culture. In order for me to win my neighbor who is an adulteress, I have to participate in her lifestyle in order to win her. Remember the Titanic at the front of the church that I talked to you about a few days ago? Was everybody here when I was talking about that? In the front of my, um, this large Canadian church, we're talking, anyway, it was a double deck, it was one of these big churches. They had... Um, it was really, really popular. It is a godless, adulterous, idolatrous film. It is a pagan film from start to finish. 
they, because it was so popular in the culture and they wanted to win the people of the culture into the church, they took something from the culture and they made this ship at the front and put the word Titanic on it and used that as their church's theme for the, that period of time. And I'm walking into the church, that, what are you guys doing? The philosophy is I have to participate in the things of the world, i.e. Satan's so-called deep, dark secrets, in order to win them because now I know what it's like to be there. Well, that is the diametric opposite of everything that you see from all 65 books prior to Revelation. How many times did God tell his people, come out from among them and be ye separate? Not separated. We're not we're running into, into Hutterite colonies here. We need to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We need to rub shoulders with people that are unsaved, just like Jesus did. So we're not to be separated, but we are to live a life that is separate. Bingo, exactly, right, a nail on the head. So what these people were doing were that they were participating in the things of the culture with the guise of, with the false set of uh, uh, understanding that unless I actually participate in the things of the world, I won't understand the world and therefore I won't be able to draw the world into the church. Well, guess what's happening? You're drawing the world into the church. You're sullying the church. You're not being the church. The church is designed to be a city set on a hill, a light. And you're darkening the light by bringing idolatry. In. And it's always the same two things. Satan is a very, very clever guy, he all, but all he does is repackage the same poison in a different generation. It just looks different today. We got this thing called Hollywood. No generation has had Hollywood prior to the 20th century. We just package it differently today. Well, I have to watch these movies because that's what my youth group is watching and I need to know what they're watching. Who says? Where, where is that written? It specifically says, do not learn Satan's so-called deep secrets. That's what it says. Stay away, man. So that was, that's the one thing, and that's a, it's, it's so prevalent in our culture. That's why I get so excited about that particular thing in the letter to Thyatira. Hold on to what you have until I come. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a separation, i.e., lifestyle-wise, not separating, not becoming separate physically from the world, but dude... I need to look different. I need to act different from the world. And these so-called deep secrets, I don't need to know. I, I, I don't know what Nashville, I don't, I can, all I need to do is go into some grocery store where they're playing that stuff, and I get my groceries and I am out of there so fast. I don't want to listen to that stuff. Anything else you guys want to add? Okie dokie, I think we did Sardis earlier. Philadelphia, who had Philadelphia? All right, go for it. Yeah, we will, we, we will uh, what chapter? Three verses seven. Uh, yep. mm -hmm. So the first phrase says, he, this, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the keys of David. Turn it over to you. So, um, I think the reference to keys is that um, he has the keys to, oh, there's a reference that he has the keys to heaven and hell, and mm -hmm. he has the keys of salvation, mm -hmm. he is the key keeper of everything, I guess mm -hmm. would be the understanding there. Is um, there anywhere else in scripture that talks about the keys of David? Say yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, where? <laughs> yes. All right. So this side of the room, please look up Isaiah 22, 22, Old Testament. You guys on this side, look up Acts 18, 9 to 11, New Testament. So we've got Old Testament prophet, New Testament history book, i.e. a historical book, and now we've got 
the third time in Scripture that it talks about the keys of David, and this is in a letter or an epistle in the book of Revelation. Acts 22.22 says what? What did I say? <laughs> Thank you. Isaiah 22.22. Yeah, that's a messianic prophecy, isn't it? So we've got that predicted in the Old Testament, messianic prophecy. Now let's move fast forward 650 or so years to the book of Acts, 18, 9 to 11. Anyone? Acts 18... 9 to 11, yes. Now the Lord spoke to Paul by night in a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you. And I'm reading it wrong. Nope. For I am with you, and no one will attack you or hurt you, for I have many people in the city. And he continued there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Hmm. That is. That wasn't exactly... All right, let's move on from that. So we get from Isaiah 22, 22. Let's stick with that one. The keys of David were to be given to the Messiah. And now we have in Revelation chapter 3. Let's go back there. My apologies, guys. That did not do what it was supposed to do. That this man, i.e. Jesus, the glorified one, is holding the key of David. Now, is that referring back to anything in Revelation chapter 1? Remember that picture that we get of the glorified Christ? Verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. Yeah, he holds the keys. He is the son of David and the one who holds the keys. If you want to have some fun and you enjoy a little bit of contemporary music, there's a song called He Holds the Keys, sung by Steve Green. That's, I don't know, 30 years old. So it's not, as, it's not contemporary in the sense of two, 2020 stuff. He Holds the Keys, Steve Green. It's a wonderful song based on this scripture. All right, so what is it about the key of David? Well, um, he says that I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. And with him being the key holder, that means that he has given them salvation. And Amen. He can Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now I know what the tie was with that Acts passage. It didn't mention keys, but it was at a time when Paul was being persecuted in Corinth and Jesus was telling him, carry on because I'm going to protect you. And it was the idea that I hold the keys. It doesn't say that there in that metaphor, but he was going to be the protector. I am in charge here. I hold the keys. And so he's saying it in, in a completely different way. So, yeah, that it wasn't exactly a, a key one, but carry on. Um, and then, um, for you have little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Um, mm -hmm. We were a small church and a poor church with, um, and not a big church. They were, um, yeah, not not a not a mega church, but they were. Uh, uh, um, yeah, what's the word? A faithful church. Right and on. So um, that would what is what I thought was the main point. Mm -hmm. like God isn't doesn't matter. He isn't into all the flash and. Jazz, he's all mm -hmm. about faithfulness. Mm -hmm. End of verse 8. You have kept my word and not denied my name. Verse 10. Mm. You have kept my command and to endure patiently. I will also keep you from the trial. Verse 11. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one can take your crown. Yeah. This is an encouragement letter, isn't it? Is there any call to repentance? Is there any rebuke in this letter? 
There's no review, no, nothing. It, it, yeah, very much so. So that's the thrust of the whole le the letter. It's a different, a different kind of letter. It's almost like contrasting Galatians with Philippians. The Galatians, Paul comes out with his, with his six-shooter, and he's just kind of, he's mad. And he's rebuking them right from the first chapter. Philippians? No. No. He's, he's really encouraging them. Is he teaching? Is he challenging, exhorting? Yeah. Very different tone in the letter. Same here. The letter to Ephesus at the beginning of chapter 2, the letter to Philadelphia, very different kinds of letters. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, verse 12 would be a ref or they would understand it as um, so he overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. There was a history of earthquakes and I think uh, temple mm -hmm. pillars were prone to fall over. But if yeah. they're a pillar in the temple of God, then that would be an eternal reference to being more secure. Good job. Good job. He's also, appear, it appears as if he's contrasting that pillar and that, that um, <coughs> building with a good foundation with the synagogue of Satan up in verse 9. We won't go into that. We did that with the previous one. That would have been a, a stark metaphor, the synagogue of Satan. Anything else out of... Philadelphia. Good job, guys. He's, he's also promising, um, I'm trying to find it here, but he's um, promising rewards for those who persevere through persecution. Amen. Which, Amen. Whatever Jesus has done that in back yeah. in the Beatitudes and, yeah. and in other places. Too. Very good. Very good. Very good. Now let's top it off with the best one. I don't know who did lay it. Did you do lay it this year? Huh? <laughs> All right. So take us home. This is the best one. This is this is my favorite one. Peter, you want to start or what? You got the microphone. <laughs> Laodicea. Okay, this is the last of the seven churches. And uh, it's... Uh, the location is 90 miles east of Ephesus and sort of southeast of Philadelphia. So it's in this vicinity. Right. So geographically, just out of, out of interest sake, this is in western Turkey. And if you went on a circuit, you'd visit all seven churches in a circle. They're all in the same area. And this was once a famous city near the... River Lycus, I think. Lycus. Okay. And um, the Apostle Paul, I don't know if he physically went to, to this church, but somehow he had, um, he was somehow instrumental in bringing the gospel here mm. because um, he sends salutations right. uh, in Colossae, the last chapter. Mm -hmm. In Colossians. And I think yes. he wrote a letter to Laodicea as well, did he not? In, We've, in we don't the, have it. It's not, it's not part of the canon. But, uh, but in verses 13 to 16, he mentions Laodicea mm -hmm. and he mentions these yeah. names yeah. Uh, where he greets them. And this, uh, well, this is, uh, the introduction is the same. Uh, mm hmm these things saith the Amen, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right to where we got to hit the nail on the head okay. here. There are two verses at the beginning that we know well. I know your deeds, this is 15 and 16, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. But as is, you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. I'm about to spit you, the word is actually vomit, you out of my mouth. What is he talking about? Well, if they would totally reject or totally be... But now they're, they're sort of... That is what you and I grew up with. I'm going to challenge you, based on context work, that that is actually a wrong interpretation. Not to belittle you at all, because that's the way I grew up. But that's not correct. What do you know about the water supply? Did you learn anything in your studies about the water supply of Laodicea? 
it's all, that's the context work behind this. The, the Laodicean church would have understood this right now because it was a water issue. What did you learn? Yes. Why? Why would they build this aqueduct? Why? <laughs> yes, but if you and I are going to drink water, what are we going to do? Why didn't they do that? Because the water was yucky in Laodicea. So they had to do one of two things. You mentioned one of them. And bring... Ah, exactly. Well, um, there are two, two ways that you can get good water. Bring fresh spring water, which they did not have. Sorry? In an arid area, western Turkey, there wouldn't have been enough rainwater to collect. You either bring in the cold stuff from the mountains. Excellent. That's good water. Or you would have to take the yucky water that was local and you'd have to boil it. So you either got to take the fresh stuff that's cold from outside or you got to take the stuff that's yucky and boil it to make it good to drink. You either got to be hot or cold. Those are useful. That's correct. Or you don't have useful water. You've got this lukewarm stuff. And when you drink lukewarm water, basically out of the swamp just outside, what do you got? Water that'll make you vomit. That's the metaphor. Not their spiritual condition. Well, it, correct. That's correct. The, the, it does refer to their spiritual condition, but... What you and I think, because we don't live in Laodicea, is hot, cold. When I think from my perspective, hot, cold, hot is good, cold is bad. But why would God say, I want you to be cold? But that's not the metaphor here. Cold in this metaphor, in their context, was good. It was useful. Hot was useful. I wish you were either hot or cold, because then you'd be good for consumption. You'd be safe, healthy, lukewarm. Ah, that's the stuff that makes you vomit. Isn't that, 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 doesn't that make it rich? That's your context work. Now, what's the next? He talks about um, you think you're rich. Yep. But you're very, very poor. You're yep. wretched, miserable. Poor, blind, and naked. All right. So he talks about poor, blind, and naked. Why does he pick those three things? Well, they're, um, this city had um, their resources, or they had um, their main source of wealth was gold and white raiment. And, right on. And so let's, let's just go with the gold. <laughs> You're hitting every one. Good job. So number one, they had lots of gold, but they're poor. What's the next one? Um, poor. Or so blind they're po naked. blind. Wh wh why did he use the metaphor of being blind? Well, this city was known for making medicine, so they would have known about making Sp eye, eye salve. Specifically, people would go for miles to get to Laodicea because they had a medical clinic there that had a special eye salve that was known for healing eyes. But you are blind. You got lots of gold and you're poor. You got lots of eye salve that people drive for miles to get to and you're blind. And the third metaphor? Uh, he talks about naked. So and, and they were known for making uh, clothing. You got lots of gold, you got lots of coal, clothes, you got this famous eye salve, and you are poor, blind, and naked. Can you see how the people reading this 
are going to sink deeper and deeper into their chair. This is the harshest of the letters. This well, is, this is harsh. There's nothing. The Lord doesn't commend this church with anything. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, from the others, there was, there was still some things that he said positive about them. So what is the challenge that you, we've set it up now? We've, we've taken our congregation through all of the context stuff, which is, in this particular case, extremely relevant. And I would go through all of those details on a Sunday morning because we're not going to understand this unless we understand the physical context of this city because of all those metaphors. There are four of them there. And we're not going to get the import of this stuff unless we go there. And then he says, all right, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked, and I'm ready to vomit you out of my mouth. Now he gets to the charge to them. So you're going to hit that nail. One more great big whack. Well, in verse 19, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Cor correct. What is it that he is saying? It's in verse 18. You got lots of gold in your house. You need a different kind of gold. You need to buy something else. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with purchasing with cash. You need gold. You need, uh, and I'm, 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 we're, we're on the same team here. You need gold from me. And it isn't a physical gold. That's the idea. It you need. The, it's tried by fire, so talking about eternity. Yeah, uh, that, would be m that would be more the trials and persecution and tribulation type thing that he's talking about, trial by fire. That wouldn't be eternal fire. No, but, but the gold will last. Mm, mm, mm. Amen. Because yes, it's, it's yes. By fire. Amen. Yep, bingo. Houses, right? So you think you're rich, you think you've got good eyesight, and you think that you're well clothed, but you are poor, blind, and naked. And then he nails all three of them Again, in verse 18, we've talked about the gold. You need to get your gold not from the marketplace or the bankers. You need to get your gold from me. And then what does he say? He hits the second metaphor all over again. And the white raiment. Yeah. That you, that need your you, you need your clothes from me, not from the marketplace. You need to be known for white godly raiment. Not for your fancy clothes that are sitting in your closet. Third one? Um, anoint thine eyes with eye salve so you can see. And where are you going to get that? Not from the doctor. Aren't these beautiful metaphors? I mean, the, the way in which the, the author of this, who is God himself, tells John what to write, this is just wonderful stuff. And the richness with which you can preach this to your congregation because you've done the hard work of sweat and sweat of doing the preparation, you can bring something out to your congregation now that they have never been taught before. That's fun. Yeah, I should have dug a little more about the water then. And that would have, would that have been in the... A good Bible dictionary should have that in it. A com it might be more in that particular case in a commentary. A commentary should... Sorry? It, does it mention the water supply in there? There you go. There you go. Okay. The water at Laodicea was not drinkable, so the city had it had its water pumped in from surrounding cities. Hot water from Periopolis and cold water from Colossae. There you go. However, by the time it reached Laodicea, it was lukewarm, just like the faith of the church. Yeah. To the Lord, their lukewarm ways were so disgusting they could not yeah. be stomached. Right on. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. He just took four or five verses to rebuke and discipline them. Their job was to be earnest and repent. I'm standing at the door and knocking. That's the context in which verse 20 is given to us. We often use verse 20 as a salvation verse. Nah, nah, not necessarily anything wrong with that. But he's actually using verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will come in and 
eat with him and he with me, that's actually written to Christians. That's written to a church. Right. Correct. But again, he's speaking to a church. He's telling the church to repent. These are people who are already saved. Do I need to repent from time to time of my sin? Mm-hmm. And he's, he's hitting them hard and saying, you got to repent or I'm going to vomit you out. One, he says, I'm going to take away your lampstand. This one, he says, I'm going to vomit you out. But he's talking to the church. And sometimes our church needs to repent. Sometimes I, as a part of the church, need to repent. Yeah. It's kind of a, a, a spiritual contentment, in a sense, that he's exhorting them or correcting them. And, uh, you know, not to settle with material wealth is not going to bring you anywhere in, in life. But it's a kind of, a, like it says in verse 19, uh, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So there's a, there's a correction coming, mm -hmm. and uh, they needed to s see it from that perspective, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and not from their you know, materialistic uh, view of, of life itself. Right. Temporal things. Right. In a sense, they were in spiritual poverty. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Oops. There was a song written by a Christian artist a number of years ago called Living in Laodicea. I'm going to read them. You can go home and listen to the song. O oh Lord, take your plow to my fallowed ground. Let your blade dig down to the soil of my soul, for I've become dry and dusty. Lord, I know there must be richer earth lying below, for I've been living in Laodicea, and the fire that once burned bright, I've let it grow dim. The very word I swore that I would die for has all been forgotten as the world has become my friend. We have turned from your law to trying to find a better way. Each man does what is right in his own eyes. We will pay the price for our sinning. We can never know true living. We've exchanged truth for lies. It's no small of a thing that he's done for you by shutting the gates of hell upon the cross. We were sentenced once, but now we are pardoned, and he chooses to use us though we fall. So while we're living in Laodicea, keep the fire burning bright. Don't let it grow dim. For the very word we swore that we would die for must not be forgotten, for the world may become a friend. What do you think of those lyrics? Well, it, it, it explains their situation. Mm -hmm. where they, you know, where they <clears throat> We've studied all all seven letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3 now. Listen to the specific chorus number one. I've been living in Laodicea, and the fire that once burned bright, I've let it grow dim. Which church does that best describe? Which one? Ephesus. He's actually labeling the Ephesian church and calling it Laodicea. This guy messed up in his songwriting. It probably didn't sound as good. I'm, I, I know the tune. I've been living in Laodicea and the fire that once burned bright, I've let it grow dim. So if you put Ephesus in there, I've been living in Ephesus, it doesn't, doesn't sound good. My encouragement to all of us is to use the Scripture the way it's designed. This man used the Scripture and actually used a different city, stuck it in there to make the song sound good. That's not good preaching. We need to stay close to the text and let the text do the talking to us. Now, it's still a great song. It's got a great message to it. I just have to, in my head, say, wait a minute, he's got his city wrong. <laughs> the message is still true. He just messed up the town. Anyway. Yeah. Right on. 
the message is great. The message of the song is very good. He just didn't do his context work. <laughs> uh, any he didn't. He's much old. He's significant older than I am. Anyway, any questions or comments about the seven churches and interpreting letters? Now, these letters are anyway. Let me let me. If there anything else you guys wanted to talk about in that respect. <clears throat> I, I couldn't help but think that when we look at the church today, that all of us can take truth from each one of these letters. The Amen. Amen. And so on. Amen. But I think what is reflected very strongly is that we interpret Scripture in light of our culture rather than interpreting scripture in light of scripture. Mm. And the result is that our fires have grown dim. Mm. The result is that we are powerless mm. as far as, um, as, as, far as the, the message of the gospel. Mm. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, the spirit of God is is bound and kept from doing his work because we're not handling the word of God right. Mm -hmm. We're not dividing it right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. and that, that just came through every one of those letters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. I am of the opinion that if we as preachers do good background, context, and interpretive work, the passage preaches itself. It will naturally be applicable in our culture. I think this, we're yeah. just expressing it in different ways. Yeah. 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 So the, the danger is that I have an agenda based on my background that I want to inject into the text. That is, that is, <laughs> don't do that. Start with the text and let the text do the preaching. So if I preach the text, then I don't have to worry about the fallout thereof. Because then somebody, if they want to argue, they're going to have to argue with the text. And if I get stoned in the process, it'll hurt. Because most of that stoning is going to come from inside the church. It'll hurt even more. But so be it. I will be faithful to the text. Yeah. All right. We got a lot of ground to cover. And we got an hour and 15 minutes to do it in, gentlemen. So let's... As I tell the students sometimes, gentlemen, start your pens. All righty. A little bit on preaching helps there at the beginning, Thursday p.m. We're on the top of page 40. Preaching pets. It is natural for us to want to preach what is close to our hearts. We will naturally gravitate to our favorite topics, our favorite passages, those things that we're very comfortable with. That's natural. Letter B there, it is natural for us to preach what we know well. C, however, <laughs> we are preaching the Word of God, not ours. Make sure we're preaching the Word of God, not our words. Number two there, make sure that we're preaching what God wants us to preach on that day for that audience. Make sure we're preaching what God wants us to preach to that audience on that day. 
there are times when I will be invited to go to a church and I say, I've never been there before. I may know one of the people that's in. I may know the pastor who invited me or something like that. And I say, God, what do you want me to preach on? 2 Kings 7.14 will come to my mind. 2 Kings 7.14. Well, that would not be the first thing that would run across my head in a natural order of my day. I'll look up 2 Kings 7.14. This message is sitting right there. Ask the Spirit of God. Can He do that? Sure He can. Sometimes He'll point me to a chapter. Sometimes He'll point me to a topic, and then I'll research that particular topic. But the idea is I need to find out what God wants me to teach or God wants me to preach on a particular occasion to that particular audience. He knows the audience. He's in the hearts of those, that audience before I ever get there. He knows what's going on in that audience much, 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 much better than I think I do, even if I am in my home church. So ask Him what He wants us to preach. Don't stick to what is comfortable, safe, or maybe the most familiar. Three, we must seek God to know His will for, his, for that particular sermon. That's a, just another way of saying really the same thing. Number four, keep reading and studying so that we expand our knowledge and our comfort, if you will, and our ability to preach on a variety of topics, a variety of texts. If I were to go through the 66 books of the Bible and ask in this particular context, how many times we've spoken out of each of the 66 books, in many, many, many times we've spoken out of Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Romans and maybe the Sermon on the Mount and stuff like that, and we skip maybe 30 of the books. In our Bible school, when I walked through the door, I said, when was the last time this school had a course on Isaiah? And they weren't able to give me an answer. Or they rewound the tape a long time. Isaiah, <laughs> how can you come out of college with a degree in Bible and never study the book of Isaiah? I said, that's, that's, that, we're not doing that. So we have a policy in our school now. We have a rotating curriculum where every single year is planned out so that by the time you finish with a four-year degree, you've studied all 66 books. That's important. We need, to have, we need to be able to study all of them. So keep studying, keep learning. And it may take a lot of time. That's If we can be of help at Nippon Bible College, every semester we have Bible class and a non-Bible class that's available online so that you can audit the class. You can be a part of it. And we, we specifically make it on, you know, one in the morning and one in an evening so that people who are working can get it in the evening. People who are pastors can get it during the day. And it's all in one shot so that you don't have to take out two chunks of a week. You only need to take out one. So you can look at that stuff online for this fall if that can be of help to you. We usually pick a Bible class. Ezekiel Daniel was done this last week, last year. Isaiah Jeremiah was done. That type of thing. The one that's coming up this fall, I think, is in the Minor Prophets, just for fun. Number two, where are we here? Preaching at problem parishioners. <laughs> you ever been tempted to do that? Where you got Joe Friesen that's sitting in the congregation, and you know that Joe is struggling with a particular issue, and you want to preach at him on Sunday morning. You ever had that temptation? Don't do it. Don't do it. If you want to preach at Joe, invite Joe over to your house and preach at him. But Joe does not need to hear his sermon preached for the whole congregation. If your congregation is going through a particular issue and there is a, there is a, a, a cultural thing, whether it's inside your church per se or the culture at large in Lacrete, then address the issue in front of the congregation because it applies to everybody. But if you know Joe is struggling with sin X, and you really want to make sure that he hears this sermon, then talk to Joe. Don't point your sermon to the whole congregation because of Joe. That's not good. That's not a good idea. All right. Dum, dum, dum. A under there is preach what God wants you to preach for that audience on that occasion. This is purposely repetitious. <laughs> Preach the Word of God, not our words. 
page 42, see at the top there? If God wants you to address a particular topic, make sure that it's aimed at the whole congregation, not an individual, not at a particular family. We're at the top of page 42, C. If God wants you to address a particular topic, make sure it is aimed at the whole congregation, not an individual or a family. <coughs> Preaching in the general congregation is not the place to address problems with individuals or with families. Yeah, I ripped through those pretty quickly because they were repetition. Make sure we're preaching the Word of God, not our words. Preach what God wants you to preach on that particular audience for that occasion. In the bottom one there, B, preach the Word of God, not ours. I just threw those in there as, as repeating because I think they're really important. Are we okay to go to page 42 now? 42, I think we did C, D. If the congregation needs to hear a particular topic, don't be afraid to address it with them publicly. Address the whole of the congregation. If we've got a money, greed, idolatrous issue in Church X in La Crete, preach on it. Unabashedly, don't be ashamed of it. Preach the Word of God in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with all authority. Don't run away from it. But that's not aimed at an individual or a family. That's aimed at everybody. You are the messenger of God. That sounds pretty grave, doesn't it? That's a heavy responsibility, but that's the mantle that we carry when we walk into the pulpit. You're the messenger of God, which is why we started on day one, lesson one, if you will, with character. Because if you and I are going to walk into that pulpit, we better have a lifestyle that backs it up. We need to be practicing what we preach. That's just the last of the helps. You are the messenger of God. Don't take that lightly. Don't be arrogant with it. But don't fear it either. That's what God called you to do. I was telling you about my truck. I, have, I bought a white truck because a paint to have it blue or red or green or whatever it was at the time that I was buying, it would cost me $2,500 extra, whereas if I bought a work truck that was just plain old white, it was literally $2,500 less. Well, having grown up in Steinbach, I can't spend an extra $2,500 on paint. That's just not in my DNA anymore. <laughs> so I, I drove this truck home, and I'm very happy with the truck, but it's white. How boring is that? It's white. Anyway, so my daughter said, I'm not complaining at all. I'm just, I'm just looking at the truck thinking, what, it's white. And she said, well, why don't you put Holstein decals on it? We've got hand-milked dairy cattle. It fits great. Everybody knows we've got cows in town. So I did. I went to the decal place, and I said, can you put Holstein decals on this? You should have seen the excitement on her face. <laughs> So she went pff, 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 all over my truck, put Holstein decals on it, so now I'm driving a cow down all over the place. But you know what that does? It keeps me honest. Does everybody know you're if I cut you off, you know exactly who's behind that wheel. Now, I, I, I follow stop signs and speed limits. And so that ever since I was 16, got my driver's license, that was my commitment. I want to follow what the, what the legal limits are, and I stop at stop signs and so on. So I got nothing to be afraid of. When I'm in a hurry, can I sometimes do a lane change a little bit where I shouldn't? And then I feel guilty about it. Sure, it holds me accountable. In the same way, when I mount the pulpit, everybody in town knows who's in the pulpit, right? And so when you go downtown and you chew out the parts guy at Napa, the guy that was in your congregation is in the other aisle. It's, it, there's, a, there's some accountability there, isn't there? So don't fear what you have to preach, but let us remember as men of God that we need to live what we preach because everybody's watching my Holstein truck now. I got to drive properly because he's the president of the Bible school and God's reputation, if you will, goes with me because I carry his name.
There's no, no fear of that. No fear of that. Yeah. All right. So that's, I hope, um, some, some helps in terms of preaching um, styles and that type of thing. Any questions about that? Things you would like to add? Our last genre of scripture, we're going to talk about briefly the features of apocalyptic literature, and then we're, after we take our break, we'll, ta- we'll dive into and uh, do some work in apocalyptic literature to make us more familiar with it. There are several features. You have them in your book there on page 42, right in the middle of number three, preaching from apocalyptic literature or prophecy. A, often in difficult times, if you were to research secu- excuse me, secular literature between Malachi, i.e. those 400 silent years that we call them, between Malachi 400 B.C. and what we now know as 1 A.D., in that 400 years, people were looking, craving something to be hopeful for because it was a horrible time to live in Israel. And so secular apocalyptic literature blossomed. There's a whole whack of it. It's not in Scripture because it's not inspired. But people were looking for reasons for hope. It comes often in difficult times. So when you and I get to the book of Revelation, when is apocalyptic revelation written? I, John, was on the island of Patmos because of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was difficult times. B, lots of imaginary creatures. You got dragons and beasts and goats with multiple horns and sheep and the this one has got the head of a beast or, or the body of a beast and the head of a man you got you get some imaginary creatures in apocalyptic literature c symbols best known one man's number six 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 you get symbols all over the place so a, a beast might have evening brother <clears throat> we got uh, a, a goat that has X number of horns and one of them breaks off or, yeah, the main one breaks off and then four of them come. Those, are, those numbers are symbolic, aren't they? That's C. D, lots of dramatic features. In one case in Revelation, you've got the, um, the beast and the false prophet and the antichrist that are all after this woman and, and the, the, uh, she starts running and he throws a whole bunch of water after her to try to drown her and then the, the, the ground breaks open and all the water falls into the big crack that God causes to save the woman from the deluge. So you've got lots of dramatic features. You've got bowl judgments and seal judgments and trumpet judgments. A third of the earth is dying from this pestilence and then the third of the, the sea turns to blood. That's pretty dramatic. Lots of dramatic features. We're on page 42, and we're working our way toward the bottom. We're on E there. Frequently, visions and dreams are involved. I don't push visions and dreams per se, but in our conservative Western culture, uh, we we don't necessarily um, like to hear about these supernatural things. We like things to be controlled, and we like things to stay in boxes. But if you look at Genesis... A whole whack of Genesis is based on dreams. Joseph had a pile of dreams. You know that there are four dreams in the Christmas story alone? Actually, there are five. Four to Joseph and one to the wise men. And now we've got the book of Revelation, which is a vision. God has been speaking in dreams and visions for all of recorded history. Can he do it today? I think we need to be open to that. Do we need to subject that to the word of God? Absolutely. Is it ever superior to the Word of God? Never. God's Word is supreme. But can He speak? Anyway, that's just just a little bit of a a sidelight there. Certainly, there are frequently dreams and visions involved in apocalyptic literature. F, much is futuristic. To us, we think of the book of Revelation as a whole bunch of things that are going to happen in the future. And to a certain degree, that's true, for sure. But if you think of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, to the church that was going to see 10 days of persecution, that was futuristic for them. For Matthew chapter 24, 
a lot of the things that are in Matthew chapter 24 are futuristic for that generation, but when Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, much of that chapter was actually completed by that time. So much of apocalyptic literature is futuristic, but if you look at apocalyptic literature in Daniel, for example, which we're going to look at in just a bit, a lot of the prophecies that Daniel gave are already historical for us. So just be aware that some of it is futuristic still, but much of apocalyptic literature has already taken place. We need to be discerning in both camps. G, <clears throat> apocalyptic literature both conceals and reveals. So the book of Revelation is called that for a reason. It is designed to reveal a whole bunch of stuff. But do we understand everything about the book of Revelation? Do we understand what all of the symbols mean in those imaginary creatures? One day we will. One day we will understand them as well in the future as we understand a whole whack of the, the beast and the, the, the stuff that Daniel talked about, the Babylonian Empire, and then he talked about the Medes and the Persians, and then he talked about the Greeks, and he talked about the Romans, Antiochus Epiphanes and all of the Syrians and, and that the Seleucids and the Ptolemies and that jazz. There's a whole whack of stuff in Daniel that is history for us. We understand it in retrospect, but there's still a lot of stuff in Revelation we, we don't necessarily understand. Yeah. 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 Can we increase its value to us by studying it, yeah, but there's going to be some stuff about apocalyptic literature that we're just going to have to say, I don't quite understand it all. Or we might say, I think it might mean this, but we have to tread softly and say, I'm not perfectly sure. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what I need to concentrate on. I do know what that means. That's clear. Some of the stuff in apocalyptic literature isn't perfectly clear because some of the things are concealed and some are revealed. H. Next page. We're now on page 44. Biblical apocalyptic, biblical apocalyptic literature has other genres embedded. If you look at your Bible, um, I'm not sure about the King James, but other translations, if you look through the book of Revelation, for example, you'll see many poems in there. In fact, if you've Excuse me. In chapter 5, just above chapter 5, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Verse 11, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory, honor, and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. In chapter 5, verse 9, you are worthy to take the scroll. You get the idea. There are multiple poems, almost like songs. In fact, many of these are songs in Handel's Messiah. If you've ever seen Handel's Messiah, there's a whole whack of them in there. So there are, there's poetic genre in, instilled in here. In chapter 1, you have the historical, I, John, was on the island of Patmos, and I was on the Lord's Day. That's history. We know that there's actually a real place called Patmos. There was a real persecution under a real emperor and a real apostle, and this was part of his story. So there's historical, there's narrative that's there, not a whole lot. And then you've got epistolary literature, i.e. epistles, letters in chapters 2 and 3. So you've got actually a fair number of other genres embedded into the book of Revelation. So apocalyptic literature has other genres embedded. Number, uh, letter I, it frequently overwhelms the recipient. I fell at his feet as though dead. When I saw that vision, I fell flat on my face. That's typical of apocalyptic literature. And last but not least, J. There are promises that things will get much better in the future. So there is all of this tribulation, if you will. We can talk about whether that's small t or large t tribulation. <clears throat> 
But there's, there's this nasty stuff that has to happen. But at the end of apocalyptic literature is always the promise that things will get better in the future, even glorious. So by the end of Revelation, what do we have? We have a picture of the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. There's no temple because God is there. There's no light source because God is there. And there's, there's a tree that has different fruit every single month. I particularly like that part. There's a, there's a, a river that runs through the city and, and waters everything. Streets of gold. You get the idea. That's pretty glorious. That's typical of apocalyptic literature. Those are the ten things. Any questions about that? When we come back from our break, we're going to study a particular piece of apocalyptic literature and pick out those features. So let's take a break. We'll come back.
All right. What I'd like us to do for the next bit is to go to Daniel chapter 8. Mm -hmm. Daniel is one of the couple of books in, well, actually there are probably half a dozen or so books in the Bible, four, I can think of four right off, anyway, that are what are called bifids. They're in two distinct equal chunks. The first six are stories, narrative, and the last six is all apocalyptic stuff. So we're going to jump into the apocalyptic side here. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision. What I want you to do is in pairs, pick a partner, any partner. I would encourage you to work with somebody that you haven't worked with yet this week. And I want you to apply those 10 characteristics of apocalyptic literature and see how many of those 10 you can find in Daniel chapter 8. That's your assignment. So you got 10 minutes. What does it say? Quarter after there? At 25 after, a bell will ring. <laughs> and see if you can find all 10 of those features. In number three, yes, there are 10 there. And you can work with Martin.
Testing one, two. Are they still connected with us? Okay. So let's come back, not necessarily physically together, but let us, um, in our minds, glad that you're diving into this. That's fantastic. Daniel chapter 8. Quite a few of these features in here, aren't there? Yeah. So, number one there is often in difficult times. What do you think? Mm, when it says often in difficult times, it's referring to the times of the person to whom the vision is being given. So we're talking about the time of Daniel as opposed to the times that the vision itself is describing. So when John was on the island of Patmos, that was a difficult time. He was there because of persecution. The emperors didn't want to have anything to do with Christianity. In fact, they persecuted those who were the leaders of Christianity. So this apocalyptic vision of Revelation was given during that time. What about this one? Yeah, where was he? They were in captivity. That's right. Yes. So he, right on. Yeah. So would it have been helpful for them to have a vision of, hey, this is what's going to happen, and at the end of that, things are going to get glorious? You can see why God would send this vision at this time. Number, uh, letter B there, imaginary creatures. Any imaginary creatures in here? <laughs> Give us an example, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got you've got a a single horned goat. The, go the horn is broken off and we can talk about what that means, but certainly an imaginary creature. Yeah. 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 There's a, a ram with two horns, and, and the horns were long. <laughs> any other ones? Did you guys pick out any other? Correct. Correct. So we're going we're gonna to hesitate in terms of interpretation of all this. But recognizing the images, recognizing the features of apocalyptic literature so that we can approach this kind of literature in our preaching correctly for, for tonight. I wish we had more time, but maybe next year. <laughs> Any other creatures? Any other imaginary creatures? There you go. Right? Let's go to number C, or letter C. Any symbols? Yeah, yeah, you've got horns. In fact, in one case you got one horn, and in the next case you got four horns. So these numbers are symbolic, yes. What else? What other symbols do we have? How about that ram that went across without touching the ground? Yeah, that's symbolic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. All right. <laughs> that's good. Don't. <laughs> dramatic features. Any dramatic features here? Agreed. Agreed. What else is dramatic here? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. What else? Actually, the whole thing. 
If you, if you look at all these symbols, uh, if you're the one in this vision, I'm thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes, this is verse 5, came from the west, crossing the whole earth, didn't touch the ground, it came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing by the canal, and charged in a great rage. I saw it attack the ram furiously, striking the ram to the ground. You can imagine reading for this for the first time, passing this down to your children, and my goodness, there, there's a fair amount of drama happening here. The whole thing's dramatic. E, visions and dreams involved. The whole thing is a vision. There you go. There you go. F, much is futuristic, but remember, much has already taken place. Was this futuristic for Daniel? Yeah. Is it futuristic for you and me? Yeah. Yeah. In this particular case, I would propose that the whole chapter is in our history books. In this particular case, this was apocalyptic for him. For us, it's history. All of this had taken place by the time Jesus came to earth. The, the man, the shaggy goat, it tells us here, the shaggy goat is the king of Greece. So we've got the Medes and the Persians under whom Daniel is living at the time that he receives the vision. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and that one we know to be Alexander the Great. He was the one that came across so quickly, and then in the height of his power, when he was still young, he died, which is the symbol of the horn being knocked off, and his four generals split up the um, kingdom, and that's why the, the four horns came. So this whole vision is actually in our rearview mirror. So when we look at apocalyptic literature and interpret it, um, we have to, part of the work that we need to do approaching the text before we preach it is to understand which of these things is already past and which is going to be in the future. G, conceal and reveal. Is there lots of stuff that's revealed here? Yeah, yeah, which actually is pretty uncommon for biblical apocalyptic literature. This is very helpful. We also have the great benefit of history because we've, we've seen this already happen. If you look in your study Bible, oh yeah, so that was Antiochus IV Epiphanes, and he, uh, blah, 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 and that's what he, you can look in the history books, and this is all, this is all um, past tense for us. In in Revelation, obviously, it's telling us some things that there will be something that's going to happen in the ocean that a third of it is going to turn to blood and all the fish are going to die. Is it actually going to be blood? I don't know the answer to that. Did God turn the river Nile into blood at the time of Moses in Egypt? Yeah. Did all the fish die? Yeah. Could he, in fact, turn a third of the oceans into blood? Yes, he can. Will that be indeed what it is? I don't know the answer to that. That's, that's a little, perhaps, a piece of it that's concealed. But it's revealed enough to say that, you know, something catastrophic is going to happen with our water supply, with our oceans. And then it talks about pestilence and that type of thing. So there's both concealing and revealing. H, biblical apocalyptic literature has other genres embedded. Did you find any other genres, any other kinds of literature embedded in here? 23. Okay, I see what you're saying. I would have to look at the original language to see whether or not it is intended to be taken as poetic. Um, I think it, 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 it's more, it looks to me to be more structured as, as narrative and explanatory. Not narrative in the sense that it's already happened, but it's more explanatory of the, of the vision. But if one looks right at the very beginning of the book, sorry, exactly, that's history. In the third year of King Belshazzar, well, he was a real king. We're not talking about some king with a horn and, you know, he looks like a goat and that type of thing, was, which is the image. This was in the third year of King Belshazzar, I, Daniel, had a dream. I was in the citadel of Susa, in the province of Elam. 
That's history. We'll get to the end of the chapter in just a second. So there are other genres embedded, something to look for for us to understand the, the thing as a whole. I, it frequently overwhelms the recipient of the vision. Did you see that one? Where? What does it say? And 27. Read 27 for us. Yeah. <clears throat> this particular translation says it this way. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. Yeah, it hit him pretty hard. That's typical of apocalyptic literature. Frequently overwhelms the recipient of the vision. And J, it promises that things will get much better in the future, even glorious. Any, th th is that feature seen here? Yes, he will be destroyed, but not by human power. There will be hope. So the hope isn't emphasized perhaps as much as it is in other apocalyptic passages, but there is an element here. And this certainly does not stand alone in Daniel. This is a single chapter that we're talking about here as part of several chapters of apocalyptic literature. But there is an element of hope here. Any questions about that? So you now have the tools to look at apocalyptic literature and it probably takes a little bit more work because it's, it's outside, in many respects, our realm of comfort. I'd much rather go to an epistle. <laughs> but now you've got some tools to approach apocalyptic literature, things to look for so that we can bring what God wants to teach his people out of the text. Comments or questions about that? Yeah, yeah. The Bible dictionary, you'd have to search a lot more because you'd have to go, because all Bible dictionaries are built topically. They're not built on passages. Your study Bible is actually probably the most succinct. You get the most information. It'll say, this verse, write it down at your study, bottom of your study Bible. It'll say in verse 27 that this means this. Verse 28, this means this. That's where a good study Bible is, is quite helpful. But your commentary, absolutely. You'll have to look a little harder for it in the sense it'll take more reading to do it in a commentary. But a commentary might actually bring out more than your study Bible because your study Bible doesn't have a whole lot of space to work with. Yep. All right, because we don't have tomorrow, I'd like us to do one more. And this one is a futuristic one. This one is not in the rearview mirror. And that's Revelation chapter 4. So I'll give you 10 more minutes and we'll come back in 10 minutes to do the last chunk. Revelation chapter 4. Same, Same drill. Mm -hmm.
Testing one, there we go. Thank you. Often in difficult times. Was this written in difficult times? For sure. For sure. So what is the context of this being written? Right on. Right on. So let's remember that the context of this is the island of Patmos, chapter 1. Certainly the people who opened this book for the first time did not see chapter 4 as being divorced from chapter 1 at all. Continuation thereof. Hope for the future. Would this vision have instilled hope? There's certainly worship there. Yep. Why would this vision have instilled hope? He was on the throne. Absolutely. God is on the throne. He is on the throne. Absolutely. Yes. What is actually happening in heaven right now, according to John, is that God is on his throne. That wouldn't have gone over too well with Nero, but that's why the vision was given. It was because they were living under a human king who was on a human throne, but God is on his throne. That would have given them great hope. Were there any imaginary creatures? Yeah, a couple of examples. Yeah, so here we've got a little bit of a, a marriage, if you will, between imaginary in the sense that was it a lion? Not, not probably, but was there actually a creature that John saw in heaven? Probably there was a real creature. It wasn't necessarily an imaginary creature in the sense of uh, uh, one that was to, you know, the goat in Daniel chapter 8. That was an imaginary creature. There was no real goat there. It was part of his vision. Here, he's in heaven, and he's seeing actual things that are ha happening in heaven, and there's some sort of creature up there, and the best language that he can think of is that, well, guys, it looked like a lion. That's the best I can come up with. The next one, it looked like an ox. Now, what did it actually look like? We'll find out someday. So was it imaginary? Well, the description was kind of imaginary because it was like an ox. Was it an ox? No. But in the sense that there was something that he saw that was real, that is in heaven right now, in that sense it wasn't necessarily purely imaginary like the goat and the ram in Daniel chapter 8. Were there symbols? What kind of symbols did you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it says that the one who sat there, verse 3, had the appearance of jasper and ruby. Does, is God made of precious stones? Unlike the idols that the culture at the time would have worshipped? No. But what was the symbol there? Why did he use jasper and ruby? I think it's primarily that he is utterly beautiful. He probably picked two of the most precious, most beautiful stones that he could think of. <clears throat> it's hard, and one would not want to inject too much in, but certainly there had to have been some sort of light as a part of that vision. But the jasper and the, and the ruby would have would have been something gloriously beautiful. So there's a, certainly a, a symbol there. Any other symbols in there? Yeah. Yeah. There was a, there was a, was it an actual sea or was it just a, a great big huge something that looked like it was a sea? I don't know. 
We'll, we'll find out when we get there. My, tr my translation says, like a sea of glass, yeah, yeah, oh well, <laughs> oh well. So what are we here? Symbols? The first living creature was like a lion. Do you think he picked lion because there were features of a lion that were symbolic? Probably. Next one was like an ox. Why an ox? Beast of burden, different than a lion? Probably. Then they have all these eyes in front and back. Was that literal eyes or was that symbolic of penetrating, being able to see, and you just can't get away from the, 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 the discernment of this creature? I don't know exactly what, you know, that's the whole idea of reveal and conceal. There's an awful lot revealed here, but what did it actually look like? We're going to have to wait till we get there. Oh, okay. Don't do that in an auction, by the way. <laughs> I did that once at an auction. Yeah, that was not the most brilliant thing I've ever done. I was waving at somebody that was down there, you know, showing off their 4-H steer. <laughs> there was, that didn't, didn't have all of the uh, synapses working completely that day. Frequently, oh, oh, sorry, we skipped over one. Dramatic features, any dramatic features? Absolutely. Tell us the picture. Draw us the picture. <laughs> yeah, if you think about it, you've got one throne with the Son of with God Himself on it, and then you've got all these probably people. Was it twelve tribes of Israel and twelve apostles? I don't know exactly. We could do a little bit of conjecture there. And I don't think that that's the point. The point is we got these 24 people who are elevated and enthroned above everybody else in heaven. They've got thrones next to the throne. But every time you turn around in the visions in Revelation, what are these 24 guys doing? They're falling down. <laughs> they don't spend an awful lot of time on their thrones. They're always worshiping. And this is the first time that you see it in the book, which would be relatively dramatic. John sees for the first time that the one enthroned in heaven is being worshipped by everybody else that it has their throne there. That'd be pretty dramatic. Excellent. That'd be dramatic, for sure. Yeah, and then you've got these creatures. I mean, the whole picture. Can you imagine what that would have been like to actually see this? Absolutely. Dramatic features. E, visions and dreams involved. The whole thing is a vision. Yes. Much of it is futuristic. Well, I would suggest that perhaps this is what is happening in heaven right now. We just won't see it face to face until we see Jesus. So this particular event, I would suggest, is actually a picture of what's happening in heaven right now. Not necessarily a futuristic thing in the sense of this event is going to happen, seal judgments, trumpet judgments, etc. That was futuristic, and we, we, won't, we don't have time to do this 14 times tonight. But G both conceal and reveal. Is there stuff that's revealed here? Yeah, we talked about a whole bunch of it. Is there stuff that's still concealed? Give us an example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that's concealed. Anybody? Good job. We got 24 thrones, we got 24 elders, but who are they? Is it Jacob? Joseph? Old Testament Moses? Joshua? It doesn't say. 
It tells us we got 12 of them. Is it John, James, Peter, Andrew, the 12 apostles, and not Judas, but Paul there? Uh, is that on this side? I don't know. One day we'll find out. H, biblical apocalyptic literature has other genres embedded. What did you find? So when we talk about genres of scripture, we're talking about other, uh, in apocalyptic literature, we may find a story or an epistle or a poem, other kinds of literature inside apocalyptic literature. That's what, in this particular case, that's what we're looking for. What is it? Right on, right on. So that's poetry. Bingo, bingo, you get poetry. When I was in Bible college, sang in a choir, and when we were touring, one of the faculty members would tour with us and would do the sermon at the end of the service when we were done singing. One of the guys got up and his entire sermon was going through the whole book of Revelation and just reading the poems of worship in Revelation. I don't remember a whole lot of sermons from when I was 19 years old, but I remember that one just taking the poems in Revelation. That was a good sermon. I still remember it today. Other genres embedded, looking for things like um, 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 narrative. There's not really a lot. You can say, after this I looked, and there, this is verse 1, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. It kind of goes straight into the vision, doesn't it? Other genres embedded, verse uh, number I, frequently overwhelms the recipient of the vision. Is there any evidence of that? Not in the chapter, but where do we know that John indeed was overwhelmed by his vision? We read chapter 1. Correct. That's a good exercise for me to be reminded that this was not isolated once again from chapter 1. So if I'm going to preach on Revelation chapter 4, I need to make sure that my congregation knows about chapter 1, and I probably should start there and preach on chapter 1 one Sunday before I ever get to the rest of the book. Because the rest of the book is really based on that core understanding of chapter 1. And the last one, it promises that things will get better in the future, even glorious Hallelujah. If I'm preaching on this passage, I'm going to be talking about Isaiah chapter 6. What do we know about Isaiah chapter 6? Did Isaiah have a vision of God in heaven on his throne? He sure did. And what was happening in Isaiah chapter 6? There were creatures flying around the throne. And what were they saying all the time, day after day, night? Well, they didn't have night in heaven. Right on. And what's here? 650 years later, they're still singing holy, holy, holy. Well, what message am I going to make sure my audience hears that day when I preach this? Guess what's still going on today? He was on the throne in Isaiah's day. He was on the throne in John's day. He is still on the throne today. Does that give you hope? Is that not glorious? Is that not you and I are going to be able to join Isaiah? We're going to be able to join John. And we're going to be able to join the 24 whatever guys that are on the throne that don't spend a lot of time on the throne. And you and I are going to be able to worship and sing holy, holy. And we're going to see these creatures and we're going to be able to experience. Does that not give you joy? Does that not give you hope? Does that not give you an understanding of the future glory that we're going to be able to participate in? That's the primary reason why Revelation was given to us. Not to tell us what's going to happen on day one and then day two and is Jesus going to come back before the tribulation or after the tribulation. Man, don't split your church over that. We're going to be doing this for the rest of our lives. The rest of our existence. He's on the throne. He's on the throne. That's what the central message of this is.
things are going to get glorious. One day I'm going to join those 24 elders. That's going to be magnificent. Preach it like that. Anything you wanted to add? We've gone through all 10 twice. Well, guys, it's been a pleasure to work with you. Why don't we pray? And then we can go to our various homes and prepare for worship tomorrow. Father, I commit each of my brothers to you and ask that as we have spent time together learning how to be excellent communicators of your word, may we rightly handle your word so that we can have a foundation, a solid foundation of understanding your word first and being able to communicate it second. May we be men of character. May we be men who study to show ourselves approved to you, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. May we mount the pulpit with confidence, not because of anything we've done, but as we have used the principles that you've left behind for us to study the word that you've left behind for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings, brothers.